Thank you, Zach. I just want to say I'm so grateful for Zach and, and Robert doing that this morning, trying to practice for when we're going to be gone in a couple of weeks. So that was great. They came here, set up all by themselves. Uh, I didn't, didn't do anything today. They did all the technology. They did all the setup. Everything was great. So I think they've done a wonderful job this morning. Thank you very much for doing that. Yeah. Yep. All right. So good morning. I would like to welcome you to Hope Community Fellowship. And if this is your first time with us, then I would just like to say welcome. And if this is not your first time with us, then I'd like to say welcome back. So we've made it to our final week in this study that we've been conducting on the five functions of the church, which are also the five functions of a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. I mean, we've already discussed, you know, worship, instruction, which is biblical knowledge, uh, fellowship, and evangelism. And this week, we're going to get that final function, which is service. So our primary passage today is going to be from the Gospel of John. It's going to be in chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. So if you brought your Bibles, then go ahead and turn to there and, and, and join me there. So who wants to be a servant? No child ever says, man, when I grow up, I want to be a servant. I think I want to be a slave when I grow up. Never heard a child say that before. You know, it's our inborn nature. It's natural to us. And by the way, the world confirms to us that it's much better to be served than to serve. I mean, that's what's natural for us. Our natural self, you know, that 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 self that was born in the image of Adam, it recoils at the thought of humbling ourselves and serving other people. It's not something that any of us want to do. But that's not what Jesus taught those who follow Him. Indeed, in Matthew 20, verse 28, Jesus says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. So Jesus is telling His followers that He didn't come here to be served. I mean, He wasn't out seeking what could He get from the other people. He wasn't out trying to find out what could this world offer to him. If he was going to be the guy in charge, what could he get out of being in charge? And unfortunately, throughout history, that is what most leaders have always done in the past. They're always seeking, what am I going to get out of, out of all of this? But Jesus had a different message. I mean, He taught us that whoever wants to be great in the kingdom of God, you have to be a servant to everyone else. And that's kind of exactly opposite of what the world teaches and what our natural self teaches us. I mean, Jesus taught this idea to His followers that you know, while they accompanied him throughout his earthly ministry. Just think about that. These followers of his, the disciples, these men followed him around for three years. This was going to be an essential message for them to grasp. I mean, you know, during that time, during that three years, while he is teaching them this message, they were with him as he healed people. I mean, he healed people from demons and from sickness and from disease and from infirmities and from, you know, from, from, from deformities that were from birth. I mean, he restored sight to blind people. You know, Jesus did all of these. They watched Jesus feed thousands of people from just a few fish and a couple loaves of bread and have plenty of leftovers, by the way. 
I mean, they, they listened to him and they learned from him as he taught the masses about the kingdom of God. But serving others, it truly does go against our core. I mean, this is such a bizarre concept that even though they, they watched him and listened to him and learned to Jesus for three years, his disciples still didn't get it. They still didn't get it. On his journey from, from, uh, from up in the north, from Galilee, on his journey down to Jerusalem for that final time, we kind of see a, a, a little bit of insight into the, how the disciples understood servant leadership. On the way down there, two of his closest disciples, John and James, two of the inner three, they come to him and they ask him, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, can we set at your right and left hand? I mean, these were the two positions of honor to be at the right and the left hand. And after they've been with him for three years, and he's been teaching them how to serve others, and he's been constantly telling them that if you want to be the greatest, to be able to set on the left and right hand side of him, if you want to be the greatest, you have to be the least. You have to serve everybody. And they still didn't get it. I mean, it was just an alien concept to them. So our passage that we're going to be reading today and we're going to be studying, this is Jesus' final lesson to His disciples about serving one another. So be, before we begin with our passage, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him for His blessing upon our time in His Word. Please join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we just pray that, that You would open our minds, Lord, to this concept of, of service, that we would, we would see from Your Son the example that He has left us to be a servant of all in our lives, Father God. We just, we just pray that You would help us to, to humble ourselves and to see that we are above nobody. Father God, we just pray that you would, you would open our hearts, soften our hearts to receive your word as we hear it. Open our eyes and open our ears to see and hear what it is that you're trying to tell us. We pray all of this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So if you would, join me in John chapter 13, and we'll start off with verse 1. It says... It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for Him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under His power and that He had come from God and was returning to God. So in these first three verses, John sets the stage for us. These three verses give us context about what's going on here and it gives us context for the next five chapters in John's book. I mean, this scene plays out the night before Jesus' crucifixion. I mean, He's mere hours away from dying on the cross. Jesus and His disciples have entered into the upper room of a house that was given to them to hold this feast. Jesus understands what is about to take place over the next 24 hours. His atoning death on the cross but I don't think his disciples quite understand what's going on. I mean, just days before, Jesus rode into Jerusalem as the masses stood out there and laid palm branches before him, you know, hailing him as the king, crying out, Hosanna to God in the highest. I mean, he had been teaching in the temple 
all week long. And people loved to come and see him and hear about the things that he was teaching. It's true. There were some people there, the religious elite, the scribes, the Pharisees, you know, they were there, the chief priests. They didn't all quite love the message that he was giving out, but hey, can't please everybody. But everybody else pretty much did. Jesus knew that his hour had come. He spends the next few hours with his disciples teaching them and praying for them. He's been teaching them about serving others, again, his entire earthly ministry. But this night that we're getting ready to read about, this night is the final lesson for them. So it really, really, really needed to be a little bit dramatic so that they would remember this lesson for the rest of their lives. So as we continue in verse 4, we're going to hear about what happened up there. He says in verse 4, So he, being Jesus, so he got up from the mill, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us about, okay, was Peter, you know, the third disciple to have his feet washed? Was he last? I mean, Scripture doesn't really reveal to us. It just says that when Jesus came to him, that him and Peter have this conversation. Of course, it's going to be Peter who stands up and speaks out about what's going on. But now remember, this is the same Peter who earlier had confessed to Jesus about who he was when Jesus said, Who do you say I am? Jesus asked that question directly to Peter. He said, Who do you say I am? And Peter said, The Messiah, the Son of the living God. So Peter knew this. Peter knew who Jesus was. Indeed, he had seen the miracles for the last three years that Jesus had performed. Peter walked on the water. Peter saw Jesus transfigured on the mount, talking to Moses and Elijah. He saw him transfigured in all of his glory as God. Peter knew exactly who the man standing in front of him was. And this did not set well with Peter. He knew that his master was getting ready to take on the role of a slave and humbly bow down before him to wash his feet. Now remember, this is the same Jesus who John the Baptist said, he, being John the Baptist, he was not worthy to untie the sandals of Jesus. And now Jesus is down on his knees, bowed before his servants and his followers, cleaning their feet. But verse 7 is the key verse here, and I don't want you to miss this. Jesus tells Peter again in verse 7, he says, Realize now, or, he said that Peter does not realize now what I am doing. But later, you will understand. And what Jesus is indicating is that now, right now, Peter, living in your natural condition, without the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you, living in your natural condition, born in the image of Adam, 
with a sinful nature. This doesn't feel right to you now. But after the resurrection, when the Holy Spirit of God comes and indwells within you, when you are born again, when you are born in the image of the second Adam, Jesus Christ, as a new creation, as a citizen in the kingdom of God, service will become as natural to you as breathing. You won't feel subordinate to other people after you've been born again, after the Holy Spirit comes to indwell in you. So as we continue in that story, Peter's getting ready to respond back to him, and he says, No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, said Simon Peter, replied, Not just my feet, but my head and my hands as well. In typical over-the-top fashion, Peter wants to totally please Christ. Remember, this same Peter that did get out of the boat when the Lord told him to come, on the water. In that same typical fashion, Peter wanted to please Christ. You know, Peter's not the type of guy that a dab will do you. Nope. Peter don't want a dab. Peter wants it all. Peter wants all of Christ. And he really did mean well here. But again, as usual, Peter doesn't fully comprehend the spiritual lesson that Jesus is trying to teach. Yet. Not yet. But soon. Soon he would. As we continue on, it says, Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. The whole body is clean, and you are clean. Though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, not every one was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. Jesus returned to His place. To His place as their Lord and their teacher. What He had just done for them was the duties of a slave. When people entered into a dwelling, you know, their feet needed to be clean. They had been out on the dirty, dusty streets that, you know, there's dirt, there's dust, there's animal droppings everywhere. And these are the streets that they're walking through. And when you came into somebody's house or even into your own home, your feet needed to be cleaned. But that was a dirty, nasty job. Only slaves and servants would do such a task as this. When Jesus asked them if they understood what He had just done for them, I can imagine in, in their minds they're thinking, yes, I do understand. You just grabbed hold of my feet, you got some water, and you cleaned them. All they could feel was the physical thing that Jesus had just done for them. But listen here, Jesus' lesson here was not trying to teach them how to clean the feet of other people. That's not the lesson that He was trying to get across. He was trying to teach them a spiritual lesson that would stay with them for the rest of their lives. Jesus was teaching them kingdom truth. And now that Jesus had resumed His place among them as their teacher and as their Lord, He's going to impart this spiritual wisdom of this lesson to them. He says to them in verse 13 there, He says, 
You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. There it is, right there. Jesus said, You call me Lord. Calling Jesus Lord is an acknowledgement that He is over you. He is of higher value than you. When you call Jesus Lord, you are saying, I submit my life to you. And now His message to followers is, now that I, your Lord and teacher... By the way, did you notice in that verse that He mentions that to them twice? He calls Himself twice, your Lord and teacher. So I think He's emphasizing this to them. Hey, I am above you. I am the Master. You are truly the servants. Now that... I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You also should wash one another's feet. The kingdom truth that Jesus is showing them is that it's not below me to humble myself and do this degrading task for you who say, I'm above you, and then, and then you should be willing to do this for one another. If you say that I'm your Lord, meaning that I'm above you, and I will do this for you, you should be willing to do that for one another. This is what, this is the kingdom truth that Jesus is showing them. He calls his followers to humbly serve one another. He continues there in these last three verses. He says, I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very verily, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus says to His followers that they will be blessed if they follow His lead and humble themselves before those that they feel like they're above. You know, many times Jesus' followers have gotten this wrong. Many, many times Jesus' followers in their pride and in their arrogance let those things make decisions for them rather than love and compassion. This is why Jesus' followers are called to deny themselves every day. You see, the old self is still there. That old fleshly, earthly self that says, I don't want to be a servant. I don't want to bow down before other people and serve them. I'm going to get my hands dirty. That old self is still there. But Jesus is telling everybody that when you're born again, when the Holy Spirit of God comes and indwells in you, when you're born in the image of the second Adam. See, that's why we call it born again. The first time you were born, you were born in the image of the first Adam. Remember I told you guys about, man, if we took a, if we took a photocopy of Adam and placed an X through it, if you made a copy of that one, is it going to have the X in it or is it going to look like the original? It's going to have the X in it. And when you are born again, when you are born with that new creation, then you're able to deny yourself. 
And that's what this means. You know what? Your flesh is going to scream out, No! No! Don't do this! Do not humble yourself. Do not bow down before these people. By the way, they're below you. In social status, they are below you. In earthly goods, they are below you. Don't you know that you drive the Cadillac? Don't you know that you live in that nice big house? Don't humble yourself before them because they're below you. That's what our natural self screams out and says. But Jesus says, that's not the truth. If you are born again in His image, humble yourself, serve one another. When those who have been born again realize what Jesus has done for them, how can they but humble themselves before everybody else? I mean, I mean, this is the God of all creation speaking to us who, who chose to take on the form of man. I mean, He chose to become part of creation Himself and to come here and to die on the cross for His creation. I mean, He's the one who came and served us in that way. And now He sets this example before us, how we are to treat one another. And all we have to do is take up our cross daily, crucify that flesh, and follow Him. Follow His example. Ephesians 6, 7, and 8 says, Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one of you whatever good they do. When followers of Jesus humbly submit themselves to serve others, it's not for that other person. It's for the Lord. You're doing it to serve for the Lord. Because that is what He has called you to. Let your love for the Lord so overwhelm you that you don't even consider the status of another person when you go to serve them. Who cares if their social status is not on the same level as yours? You know, who cares whether they deserve to be served or not? Who cares? Serve them as you are serving the Lord. It's Jesus that you're serving, not that person. Oswald Chambers wrote this, Service is the overflow which pours from a life filled with love and devotion. Service is what I bring to the relationship and is the reflection of my identification with the nature of God. Service becomes a natural part of my life. If we're all honest, I think we can all improve our serve. This passage of Scripture, it's so clear that I really don't feel like I need to hammer home what the application of today's message is. When you think of this story, when you think of this story, I want you to see God. I want you to see your feet in God's hands, just like we do on the screen there. I want you to see your feet in God's hands. He was not afraid to take on human flesh and become a man, the man Jesus, willing to touch your feet, your filthy, dirty feet, and spiritually, your entire life. I want you to see Him serving you as an example of how you are to serve others.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we know that in our lives, we see others below us, Lord. We don't always see the value that You place on every other person. When we see that beggar, Lord, we don't see somebody that You want us to serve. We just see somebody that we would rather not acknowledge as there. Father God, give us a heart. Give us a heart to see other people above us. Give us a heart to let us know to serve others who are Your creation, Father. Give us Your heart. Give us Your love. Give us Your compassion, Father. As we go out into a hurting and dying world to serve them, Father God, help us to serve one another. It's in Your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, if you would, please join me in... Uh...